to start our meeting officially. Mira. Thank you so much, Jim. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our participants today. Thank you so much for joining us um, for this webinar on lessons in working towards global eradication of PPR. As Jim said, my name is Mira Chandra, and I'm a food safety and nutrition advisor with USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Before we get started, I just wanted to briefly say that USAID is committed to strengthening livestock productivity and reducing losses due to livestock diseases. Such losses have profound impacts on the livelihoods of livestock keepers and rural economies, land use and climate, and the supply of nutrient-dense animal source food products, which are an integral, integral component of a safe, nutritious diet. Our agenda today includes opening remarks from Felix Najumi, the coordinator of the PPR Global Eradication Strategy with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Then we will have presentations outlining three different USAID funded PPR projects. Each of these projects is working in a different context to generate innovations that will better control the spread of PPR through a range of different approaches. This will be followed by a question and answer session at the end. So please do submit your questions in the chat box throughout the webinar. And with that, I'll hand it over to Felix. Uh, thank you, Chandra, and thank you, USID, for giving us this opportunity to share with you what we have been doing. But I want, be, before starting, I want to acknowledge the presence of my colleague from the Secretariat, uh, Camila uh, Anna, Anna Maria from OI was not able to attend, but I am sure that she will be joining us later. We also have somebody from the advisory committee. I think that uh, Paula from uh, Paula from Guelph University is connected. We have also those from the Global Research and Expertise Network connected. All of you, you are welcome. Then maybe the second slide, uh, we will be sharing with you the, the eradication of PPR came after ring the best eradication, uh, Andrew Beans or, or, or Jeff Marin. Uh, all of us were involved in the eradication of ring the best. But in 2011, member county requested, oh, okay, you did a good, a fantastic job. Next step, should be PPI eradication. Therefore, we start developing the PPI eradication strategy that was launched in April 2015 with three major objectives. The first one being the eradication of PPI by 2030, reinforcing vet services, and even reducing the impact of other small rumen diseases. But as we are um, targeting 2030, we have to make sure that they are in line with the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal. The next slide. Uh, why PPR? Because the economic impact of PPI is really very high. And he estimated that way the, the economic impact is between 1.5 to 2.1 billion per year as losses. Next slide. And uh, from this 2.1 billion, almost 40% of the losses are in Africa, 27 in South, South Asia, 20 in East Asia, Middle East and West Asia. Next slide. Therefore, today we are gathering to discuss the vaccine. More importantly, how are we able to use the vaccine for, uh, for the eradication of the disease? If we are moving toward 2030, in the global strategy, we agree that country will be moving from one stage to another based on the epidemiological situation. In stage one, they have to understand the epidemiological situation on stage two and three, it is major concern for us today, is where vaccination is undertaken. But today we have several type of vaccine. As you can see, it could be live combined vaccine with uh, small, uh, so small box, or it could be inactivated vaccine, it could be recombinant vaccine. Or, but more importantly, between 2017 and 2021, when we formulate the first phase of the program, we were targeting to produce almost 1.5, to produce and use at least 1.5 billion dose of PPR vaccine. But we will be formulating the second phase of the program 2022 to 2027. How many doses of vaccine will be needing for, for the next future? We will be estimating next year. How important, however, what we are, if we are looking in terms of eradication of the disease, there are almost 198 countries around the world that need to be free by 2030. 
61 at, uh, are at risk, and 58 of this county, they are already free. Therefore, next slide, we are thinking about, we are now, our vaccination campaign will be targeting around 70, 70 to 80 countries around the world, representing almost 80% of the 2.5 uh, billion small ruminants that we have in the globe. Next slide. But to achieve this, we have been organizing gathering a vaccine producer, and we have several vaccine producers connected. The last meeting was in Jordan last year, where the, in, 2000, in 2019, yes, last year, where we understood that they were need to improve the quality and the quantity of the vaccine. And Esther is planning to host the next meeting next year. We hope that really the thermostable vaccine uh, issue will come on, uh, on uh, will be discussed and we will agree on it. However, in the next uh, slide, please. When we met in 2017 in Rome, because the problem of the issue of the thermotolerant vaccine was already a major, a major concern because many of the countries that we are targeting, the 70 countries that we are targeting, they are in Sahel or maybe in high temperature, a temperature area where we need a cold chain. Therefore, how are we able to prepare, pre prepare a vaccine that will challenge at least the 40, 30, 40 degrees in several countries in Middle East, Africa, and Asia? Therefore, the recommendation of the Rome meeting requested that we should maybe try to make sure that the vaccine should be placed at any of the three temperature, being around 8 degree, 25 degree, and 40 degrees. And then AU Panvac was tasked to make sure that they evaluate the vaccine. And I am sure that maybe Charles Bojo from AU Panvac will come on it, that they should evaluate the possibility of this vaccine at 40 degrees. But more importantly, all situations should commence at day zero in the first instance. And the situation will follow in the other days, being second, third, fourth, and fifth day. General titration should be carried out at approximately the same period. The period of testing can be extended if needed. However, in Rome, this has the, the small table summarized what we agree upon that we should make sure that we assess the thermotolerant upon being maybe at the two to eight degree for two years. 25 degrees, 10 years, and 40 degrees, five years. Next, no, next slide. Then what are the major messages that we need to take from this one is that there are multiple thermostabilization methods that have been applied during the, all this time to improve the traditional vaccine. This, there are a few of them, but more importantly, today we are discussing how are we able to uh, to, to successfully use the ring derpes, the knowledge of the ring derpes, which may be referred to by multiple names, including the ILRI protocol, the Thermovax, or any other uh, Zerovax or any other method that we'll be using. Therefore, this is more or less what we are discussing today, and we hope that we will come to the conclusion. If you have any question, please contact the PPR Secretariat for any further issue. Therefore, I will pass the floor to my best friend. We know each other almost for since the year 20, or it's almost 20 years today, as we have been working together with my best friend and brother, Jeff Mariner. He's a well-known veterinarian epidemiologist. I may call him maybe the the father of the participatory disease epidemiology. He is with Taft University. He will be sharing with us what he, he has been doing. I hope that he will also have a link with what he start doing on the ring of pest eradication that we use in Somalia, South Sudan, and other areas around the world. Jeff, the floor is, is yours. Okay, thank you, Felix. Is it only 20 years? I would have said 25 or 30. <laughs> <laughs> Way back in the days of Somalia. Uh, so what I'm going to present today is, is the results of a Pestibitate Ruminant Vaccine Associate Award project funded by USAID through the University of Florida. Um, and if we can move to the next slide. Um, this is a four-year project. It's working in Uganda in the Karamojong region and also in Kenya in the Turkana and West Papart 
West Pokot, which is contiguous with uh, Karamoja as the Karamojong cluster. And in that, the implementing partners, partners are the University of Florida is the lead, and then Tufts University is the, is the technical advisor coming on vaccine thermal stability and some of the field work. And in the field, we work with Mercy Corps in Uganda, Makerere University, and on the Kenya side with Calro and uh, with the national authorities, the national veterinary services in the two countries. So as Felix was saying, at the end of Rinderpest eradication, we had a thermal stable vaccine that had a shelf life of 30 days without refrigeration. And this allowed us to go to the field without a cold chain and without four wheel drive vehicles and an enabled community animal health workers. And this was one of the keys to completing eradication in these very difficult areas like South Sudan, the war zones, Somalia, uh, and it was essential. And the idea of this project here that we're talking about today on PPR was to recreate that situation in terms of technology and the, the social innovations that we had at the end of Rinderpest. So our goal was to uh, develop commercial access to thermal stable vaccine. And we didn't specify in the project which one we would be doing. We would work with any thermal stable vaccine that we could get. Second, we wanted to work on delivery mechanisms that really capitalized on that thermal stability uh, and look at how to make these things more efficient and uh, more better incentives involving things like community animal health workers, involving farmers more. And the third thing was to um, get more involved in doing epidemiological targeting of vaccination to actually uh, potentiate the vaccination by identifying the maintenance mechanisms for the disease in Karamoja and then directly targeting those areas with vaccination. Okay, next slide. So on the vaccine, this work was actually carried out at ILRI. I used to work there. And what we did was we took the Rinderpest Thermovac method and some other methods, and we applied them to the Nigeria 75-1 PPR vaccine. And um, we found that we could produce vaccine with the Rinderpest Thermovac method that lasted up to five months at 37 degrees centigrade as a 25 dose file. So this was a very thermal stable vaccine. And that this was suitable for use in the field without a cold chain, okay? And that vaccine uh, is now being produced by Hester and it's available for purchase in 25, 50 and 100 dose presentations. And it's tested to have a shelf life of at least 10 days at 45 degrees centigrade. Uh, so this is a vaccine that's fully comparable to the, to the Rinderpest vaccine. And it's now commercially available with Panvax certificates in the whole nine yards, export license all. This slide is some of the data from the research conducted on ILRI where we've applied the Thermovac method to PPR. And here in this batch, you can see it lasted 162 days uh, at 37 degrees centigrade, so over five months. And if you look, it's a, it's a biphasic degradation curve. It has two parts. There's a rapid initial loss and then a more gradual linear decline. And it's actually this gradual linear decline that we, we work with in terms of trying to enhance the stability. Next slide. Here, this is a, a particular technique where we compare the degradation of the vaccine at various temperatures. So we evaluated it at 37, 45, and 56. And then by plotting the degradation rates at those various temperatures, we can predict the degradation rate at lower temperatures. And what we found was that at four degrees centigrade, the vaccine had a half-life of 94 years. Uh, now this is somewhat th theoretical, but what it's saying is the vaccine in a vial the vaccine inside the vial is more stable than the container, okay? So the limiting factor is no longer the vaccine for shelf life at four degrees, it's the container, yeah? So this, uh, we've eliminated the, the vaccine as the primary constraint. Next slide. Working in the field in Uganda, we, we've gone to set up business models for vaccination because we consider it a, a business type undertaking. So we had dialogue with veterinarians, community animal health workers, crowd leaders, and, um, we identified a system based on private distribution hubs where the government would issue the vaccine to private hubs. There'd be no cold chain at the hub. Transport would be by motorbike. And as, in terms of incentives, the livestock owners agreed to pay 100 Uganda shillings, which is a, a small contribution. It's two or four cents, US cents. And they'd also receive a voucher that they turn over to the community animal health worker. And the community animal health worker would receive the 100 Uganda shillings and turn over the voucher and receive 150 Uganda shillings from the hub for the voucher. And the hub in turn would turn in the voucher and get 200 Uganda shillings. So their profit per vaccination was 50 Uganda shillings. But of course, they're working with 10 or 20 community animal health workers. And this 
process uh, will be overseen by the public sector, but also by community elders um, who will validate that the coverage was as as indicated and, and the quality of work was, was good uh, for completion of payment. So we will be implementing this and testing it, uh, measuring impact as we go ahead. All right. We also reinforced the surveillance system. And what we did was we did some participatory mapping, which I'll show you in a minute, but we uh, did participatory epidemiological training, PDS, participatory disease surveillance, reinforced those skills. And then people went out and looked for rinderpest and they found outbreaks and lo and behold, they, they found them where the community said there were hotspots. One of the important things that we had to do was actually lay out the, the um, process for sampling and submitting samples for testing and so forth. So the nice thing about this was they got, samples, okay. they got samples from the field and these were submitted to Makareri within 48 hours and genomics was done. So we could actually uh, see how the, the, the viruses in these different locations fit in. You can go to the next slide, fit into the, uh, the region. The risk mapping was done by the focus groups, the same ones that worked on the business model. And they listed risk factors for PPR and then they sketched on newsprint, much like layers of a GIS, the distribution of those risk factors. So if you go to the next slide, you can see this rather busy slide. This is all the risk factors sketched for the whole of Karamoja. And the, dark, the two dark blue arrows at the top and the one dark blue arrow towards the bottom, those were the hotspots they identified. They said that all PPR outbreaks originated from these locations and went from east to west, never west to east. Uh, and when we had some, reinforced surveillance, this is where the outbreaks were identified. And if we go to the next slide, the genomics for these showed that um, they were more closely related to events in Kenya than to each other. So if you look at the red location up top, that's one hot spot and the yellow location at the bottom, those events were more closely related to Kenya and events in Tanzania than to each other. So they're actually two separate systems of virus circulation, right? Now, this is a bit surprising in that they're only separated by about 150 kilometers, but it's saying that Karamoja is not homogeneous and that is actually a lot of structure to BPR circulation. And these are the areas that we'll actually focus vaccination on as we move forward with the vaccination. And this is the kind of work that we need to do across Africa to actually understand where are the locations functioning as the maintenance sites for PPR. And it's not just a sea of virus, there's structure to this, and it may be surprising, you know, uh, prior to this work, Uganda would have said, oh, Karamoja, all one co common problem. We just had vaccinated as a whole. But now you can actually break it down into two things. Next slide. This is uh, the genetic map. And you can see one cluster of strains up at the top with the dark black circles and the other one in the middle with the dark black circles. Those are the two outbreak uh, clusters of strains. And what you can see is those clusters are more closely related to uh, viruses from places like in Gorongoro than they are to each other, okay? So this is saying the extent of these foci is across the border into Kenya, not within Uganda to each other, yeah? And there's other foci deeper within Uganda that are probably separate from these, all right? Deeper within Western Uganda. Next slide. Uh, so we published this, of course, and we also published on the, the livestock vaccine supply chain, okay? Um, these are two of the works that came out of this. We go to the next slide and finish up. The point I want to make in closing is we now have PPR vaccine that has 10 days at 45 centigrade. And this is sufficient for use without a cold chain in the field. And we need to actually talk about how we're going to do this in PPR today, right? This was done at the end of Rinderpest and there was no problems encountered with administering this system. We had no complaints. We had no reports of people not adhering to the system. If you took the vaccine out of the cold chain, you used it within 30 days or you destroy it. No compliance problems in, in millions and millions of vaccinations in multiple countries conducted. Yeah. At that time, we had a PANVAC standard of 14 days at 45. So PANVAC would test the vaccine for 14 days at 45. And that translated into to months at, at room temperature, at field temperatures. Average field temperatures are about in the hottest places in the world where people live with animals is about 25 degrees centigrade on average every day. And here's the vaccines, you know, these, these vaccines at those temperatures go, go for a year, okay? So I think we need to work with the campaign and with PANVAC to talk about a standard uh, that actually enables use of the vaccine without a cold chain. The current standard that they have of five days at 40, well, to me, any well-made vaccine should meet that. It's not really thermal resistant. 
And when that standard was put in place, it was provisional. The, the meeting actually said, well, what's the number we can work with for now while we get more data? And they came up with five days at 40, 40 C. But I think we need a standard that is actually for use of the vaccine without a cold chain. And uh, that needs to be discussed and we need to take that forward. So I'll stop there, thank you. Oh, last slide. The guy on the left is Tom Alaka. He's one of the first community in Malta where he's trained in Karamoja uh, to vaccinate against Rinderpest. And the two guys on the right are myself and Tom Alaka 20 years later. And in the background is a park Land Rover, part of the cold chain. And what you can see is the Land Rover is not working. Um, Tom is now a, a counselor for his, he's a leader for his community. He's actually the head of the council uh, for his community. And his work as an animal health agent actually, you know, laid the foundation for becoming a community leader. So the message here is invest in people and invest in social systems for vaccination, not in cold chain and vehicles. Yeah, thank you. Jeff, you have to introduce the next speaker, please. Oh, okay. Well, Michelle Dion from ILRI is now going to present uh, ILRI's work with, with the Mali Lab. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for introducing me. Um, right away, I will um, uh, discuss with you um, another approach we have used in West Africa, uh, precisely in Mali, uh, around uh, PPR vaccine production and delivery um, to the field. Next slide. Okay. Um, as you have said previously, there are uh, effective vaccines that are available. Um, and they induce lifelong immunity and they are very safe. Uh, that is the advantage of a PPR vaccine. Uh, there are also a lot of technologies uh, that are in the drawers um, to uh, for providing thermal tolerance to available vaccines. But we have not in the past uh, made a lot of effort to uh, push those technologies to the field. So um, in, a, in a Mali, uh, what we basically did is exactly take uh, the protocol Jeff uh, described uh, and uh, support a local lab uh, to produce and then to test that vaccine. We also um, developed some new vaccination strategies uh, that we have also tested and got good results on how to deliver a vaccine to the field. Next slide, please. Okay, so how do we produce and test the vaccine? So as I said, many attempts have been there to uh, stabilize the current uh, vaccine uh, to meet the requirement for high uh, temperatures. In 2015, we got a grant from USAID um, to support uh, Mali improve productivity of livestock uh, ruminant and uh, big ruminants, uh, cattle and small ruminants. Uh, in that bigger project, we had a very strong objective to uh, support vaccination of small ruminants especially PPR. And then uh, uh, we had uh, uh, an activity to, uh, to support the lab to, uh, to transfer the technology um, of, thermos, uh, of the thermosland vaccine um, to the Mali lab, and then to produce it and also test um, um, the, the efficiency uh, in the field. And also how uh, strategies to increase the vaccination um, to the field. Next, please. Okay, so we, 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 we took a public-private partnership approach where we had ILRI as a research institution. We have a central veterinary lab, which is a, a government lab in Mali, one of the, uh, uh, the, the few labs uh, that produce a livestock vaccine in West Africa, and also has to buy a science in terms of uh, providing high-tech technology on um, lyophilization of the vaccine to optimize the vaccine in the lab. So we work with Esther um, uh, to help us um, optimize the vaccine. Next slide. Okay, these are the three vaccines we have been working on. We have the classic uh, vaccine, the one which is available, um, the thermal level, uh, uh, thermal labile vaccine. And um, we have found in Mali, in the lab, that they have, they have the capacity or they had the capacity to produce the Zerovac vaccine, which is a thermosolan vaccine, which has been there for years. But they have the technology and the protocol. We also help them reproduce that vaccine. And we introduced the new uh, protocol we call in bracket the ILRI protocol, which is the same referred uh, by Jeff. Um, 
So uh, we go ahead uh, now to look at the two uh, thermo, uh, tolerant, tolerant vaccine profile uh, and compare. So as you see in the recipe, uh, they're almost the same, only the stabilizer is uh, different and also the lyophilization procedure and the distribution at the end. Next. Okay, so uh, in 2017, we're able to produce, uh, if I say we, if the Ilri lab was, I mean, LCB lab was able to produce uh, 219,000 doses of the Ilri protocol and uh, more than 200,000 doses of the Zerofax protocol. So the Zerofax protocol had no challenge. It met all the, the criteria uh, of internal control and also um, um, external control by PANVAC. But uh, we had the first lot of vaccine, we had the first batch, we had a problem of high moisture co co content in the vaccine. So in 2018, they produced a second batch. We had the same problem. And this is where uh, EFTA was critical now to help uh, reduce the moisture content, content. And in 2019, finally, they produced a good one, a good batch, uh, around 240,000 doses, uh, which met all the... Uh, internal control uh, criteria, and now is, uh, is sent to pan back uh, some weeks back for, for external uh, control to see if it meets um, um, the requirement, the international requirement. So hopefully by uh, very soon we'll get the feedback from pan back. Next slide. So these are the, the profiles uh, of the two vaccines. The INRU protocol, uh, has more than seven days because the lab, they stopped at seven days. It does not mean that it can go beyond. So they stopped the experiment at seven days. Um, and at 40 degree, we were at seven day, days. And then uh, 45 degree, we were at less than two days. Uh, for the zero back, uh, it was even more uh, um, stable because it went to 14 days at 40 degree. So zero back, uh, came out to be even um, stronger in terms of stability than the ILRI protocol, but both of them met the requirement uh, um, shown uh, earlier by, by Felix, uh, according to FAO IE reference. Next slide. Okay, so as Felix said, so um, uh, the, the threshold is 40 degree for five days, and then uh, uh, the vaccine has met those criteria. Next. Okay, so we started a uh, field trial, uh, unfortunately, and COVID hit, hit it. So, um, but we were able to do a small scale uh, field trial for the zero back, and then the efficacy was uh, 99% uh, with um, on zero conversion uh, in the field. But we were not able to process uh, the ILRI uh, protocol because of COVID. So, results are pending uh, and work will continue. Next. Um, from the lab now, we start thinking, what do we do next? Um, uh, how can we improve the delivery now? How can we improve um, uh, the access uh, of the vaccine by the farmer? So we carried out the study, uh, an ex-ante study to look at the willingness to vaccinate and willingness to, to pay for vaccination by farmers in, in Mali. And three things came out, uh, three important results. So communication was ex extremely important on the Minister of Vaccination. Uh, the transparency of the price uh, uh, of the vaccine was, was also important. And also the time uh, availability of the vaccine and the viability, like the quality of the vaccine to the, to the farmers were also important. Next, so um, how did we now uh, come up with uh, increasing the vaccination coverage? So we used uh, an integrated approach through innovation platform, which are not new. But the only thing we have done is to apply the innovation platform to our context and to see how we can put stakeholders together to work together in the planning process of the vaccine throughout the chain from the lab to the field. And uh, next. And uh, we were able in the area of uh, Sikaso and Mopti, we're able to significantly increase vaccination coverage with the uh, seroprevalence going from uh, 57 to 70 percent in Sikaso and um, 51 to 57 percent in 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 Mopti. That was only the first year, and then the project continued for four subsequent years, and we are still evaluating the the impact. Next. Okay. So what are the next steps? So as I said, uh, we have sent a batch to Panvac, 
which is funded by a new project GIZ in Ilri to, uh, to check all those vaccines. So we are waiting for the results to confirm our results. And then uh, we are also com uh, completing, uh, our, we are yet to complete the field validation for the ILRI protocol. And also the next step will be to move to, to, uh, to, the, to the policy um, investment, how really we can uh, now um, uh, take uh, ahead the, the model. Uh, and um, what will be really uh, new is how a local lab can be strengthened really to develop, uh, to position himself in West Africa and then in the region to produce the thermostable vaccine. So that is the next step. Um, next slide. Okay, these are references that you can get on the chat. Next slide. Okay, so we had a lot of partners uh, to the project. They are here. And uh, all these partners were supported by USID for the future project. Next slide. Okay, so um, the, the, the next uh, speaker is um, Laura Harvin. And Laura is the program director of Feed the Future uh, Partnering innovation for Innovation, implemented by uh, Fintrack Inc. in uh, Nepal, I think. So Laura, uh, the ball is for you. Great, Thank you. thanks so much, Michelle. Um, I'll try to run through this quickly. I know we wanna have a bunch of time for, for questions after this. Um, so we can go to the first slide. Um, I just wanted to start by briefly giving an overview of the Partnering for Innovation program for people who may be familiar, unfamiliar with it. I know a lot of people on this call have known each other for a long time and I'm a newer face. So um, Feed the Future Partnering for Innovation is a USAID funded activity that works to build partnerships with private sector agribusinesses to help them sell new products and services to smallholder farmers who represent a potential market of 500 million customers. We provide partner businesses with investment assistance, expert guidance, and the technical support they need to expand in emerging markets and create a growing customer base for their agricultural innovations. Um, basically, the goal of our project is to leverage and engage the private sector to help achieve development gains. Um, we don't work exclusively in Nepal. Partnering for Innovation started in 2012, so we've been going for quite a while. Um, and in eight years, we've worked with 75 agribusiness partners in 24 countries that have introduced 133 new agricultural technologies and services to over 1.7 million smallholder farmers while leveraging over $104 million worth of investment from the private sector. Um, so one of our current partnerships, the one relevant obviously to this webinar, is with Hester Biosciences Nepal. That partnership started in 2019 and is scheduled to end in July 2021. Um, and the partnership is working to transfer the thermotolerant PPR vaccine technology, which I know um, Jeff and Michelle already discussed. It was originally developed by Tufts to help eradicate rinder pests and was applied to PPR thanks to our colleagues on this call from ILRI. Um, so with partnering for innovation support, Hester will commercialize this new vaccine formulation in the Nepali market. Our goal is that by the end of the partnership, Hester will produce and sell 400,000 thermotolerant vaccine doses in Nepal, benefiting 100,000 farmers. Can go to the next slide, thanks. Um, Hester has come up a few times in the other presentation. So for anyone who may not know, um, Hester, Biosciences Nepal is a subsidiary of the India-based Hester Biosciences Limited, which specializes in large-scale production of veterinary vaccines and growth supplement products. Hester has been working in Nepal since 2011 and has built a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility outside of Kathmandu. Hester has been producing the non-thermotolerant PPR vaccine in Nepal since 2016, um, and they already sell that vaccine both locally in Nepal and into the international market. So you heard my colleagues discuss kind of where they are with their vaccine progress. So I wanted to update you on where Hester is with their own progress. Hester has completed all of the technology transfer steps. They've received a quality certification from PAMBAC, PANVAC and they've secured all required regulatory approvals. So effectively the technology transfer process is complete and we're now moving into commercialization. Hester is currently ramping up production and will begin selling its thermotolerant PPR vaccine this month in Nepal under the name Live Thermovac PPR Vaccine. So that's, if you take one thing away from this presentation, it's that Hester now has a 
uh, thermotolerant PPR vaccine for sale, um, both Nepal, in Nepal and internationally. Um, so our grant it, with HESTER is focused on targeting the Nepali market for thermotolerant PPR vaccine sales. So I wanted to talk about some of the challenges and opportunities in commercializing a new agricultural research product in that market. The primary challenge HESTER will face is that the rollout of the thermotolerant PPR vaccine will introduce the first fee for vaccination service at the smallholder level in most of the target geographies in Nepal. Typically, vaccination is a service of the government of Nepal and is provided at no cost to farmers. So to overcome this challenge, HESTER will need to raise awareness of the vaccine's availability and benefit among the smallholder market segment to drive demands and sales of the vaccine. Um, so our work with HESTER to date has helped assess this market segment to understand what demand might be for, the PP for a PPR vaccine, assess how much willing farmers are willing to pay for that vaccine, and evaluate which marketing strategies are best positioned to reach target smallholder farmers. So we worked with HESER to sample their target farmer population, which resulted in three primary findings I thought this audience would find interesting. One, there was a lack of awareness of PPR and its impact on livestock among target farmers. Two, nearly all farmers were willing to pay for a readily accessible PPR vaccine once they understood the costs and risks of the disease. And three, community animal health workers and local technicians were the most trusted informational resource in targeted areas because of their proximity and connection to smallholder farmers. So these findings highlighted the potential uh, for thermotolerant PPR vaccine commercialization in Nepal. Farmers do want to buy the vaccine if it's available to them locally. So to help take advantage of that opportunity, HESTER will be accompanying the launch of its thermotolerant PPR vaccine in Nepal with an awareness building campaign and roadshow that educates farmers on PPR risks and drives sales of the vaccine. Um, and all of this, HESTER will play a collaborative role and support the Ministry of Agriculture's Department of Livestock Services and their goal of controlling and eradicating PPR in Nepal. Um, so one last opportunity is that in addition to all these local opportunities, the commercialization of the thermotolerant PPR vaccine puts HESTER, um, by HESTER, puts Nepal at the forefront of the global fight for PPR eradication. HESTER and its Nepali manufacturing facility stand to play an important role in this effort when they begin exporting the thermotolerant PPR vaccine across the globe um, and supply vaccines into the global PPR vaccine market, which is estimated to be valued at 7.23 billion with a B dollars. Next slide. Um, so HESTER has an established distribution model in Nepal that leverages a series of distributors and retailers to reach more rural areas. However, as I discussed previously and as highlighted in HESTER's farmer surveys, effective commercialization of a thermotolerant PPR vaccine will depend on raising awareness of PPR and vaccine availability in last mile markets and supporting a fee for service vaccination model in those markets. So to accomplish this, HESTER will depend heavily on Nepal's network of paravets, technicians, and community animal health workers. Um, in Nepal, if you're, if you're not familiar with it, community animal health workers and paravets are local technicians who receive training from the government of Nepal's Council for Technical Education and Vocational Training. Um, with the launch of the thermotolerant PPR vaccine, HESTER will further support these technicians by conducting a refresher training course specific to PPR. This course will target 200 community animal health workers, technicians, and paravets and train them on the risks of PPR and the benefits of the PPR vaccine so that they can raise awareness and promote vaccine uptake, uptake in their communities. So as a result of this training and all of this outreach, these technicians will be at the forefront of vaccine promotion and the fee for service vaccine model in last mile markets. Um, and all together, this approach will support HESTER in fully commercializing the thermotolerant PPR vaccine in Nepal and selling 400,000 doses by July, 2021. 
Um, so yeah, that's an overview of our partnership. I've included contact information here if you want to get a hold of me. I'm also happy to have people in touch with Hester uh, Raj Guerra from Hester is also on this call. I know he'll be supporting me in the Q&A, so I, you can expect to hear from him, I'm sure, in the upcoming questions. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about our experience as a project in commercializing agricultural research technologies, I'd encourage you to visit our website here because we've done a lot of um, kind of studies and, and lessons learned on our end about that process. Thank you so much, Laura. And a big thank you to all of our speakers this morning or afternoon or evening um, for some really wonderful presentations on PPR eradication strategies and next steps. We're gonna go ahead and take the next about 18 minutes or so for a Q&A session. So participants, please feel free to continue to submit your questions in the chat box, um, but I'll get started based on some of the questions that have already been submitted. So our first question here is for Dr. Mariner and it comes from Camilla Benfield. And she says, the data so far is tissue culture based. Have field vaccination and challenge studies been done to show efficacy in vivo? Uh, no, that's about to happen. However, there's been absolutely no change to the underlying immunogen. It's produced exactly on the same cell process. So. This is basically a change in the packaging, not a change in the immunogenicity of the vaccine. Um, so we don't anticipate changes at that level, but in Uganda, we will follow up the animal serologically. Um, and I believe in Mali, the same thing is going on at their end, yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Um, our next question can be posed to all speakers. So anyone, please feel free to jump in and answer. And it is, how are challenges to PPR control the same and or different by the three regions that each program has worked in? That sounds like a question only Jeff would know the answer. I think only Jeff could compare the three. I only know Nepal, I can't speak to the others, so. Uh, we face similar challenges in different parts of the world. Perhaps in some areas, there's more insecurity than others. Um, and, and those things change over the years, but with the thermal stable vaccine, um, yeah, we can, we can reach the areas. Um, certainly in the past in Central Asia, there's been the same issues as in East Africa. Um, and, and oftentimes the whole idea of eradication is questioned by these very difficult areas. And what we found with Rinderpest, it was community animal health workers with thermal stable vaccine working without a cold chain that was required to complete the job. You know, now we have the Middle East is, is, is a mess, much more so than in the days of Rinderpest. And we're going to need very special procedures there. Yeah. But they, they can be done. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, yep. Sorry, go ahead. Vera, can I, can I add something to that? Yes, please do. Yeah, even within the same region, you may find different challenges in, uh, you know, rolling out vaccination campaigns. Yes. Uh, a critical factor is uh, uh, what are the animal health delivery policies in each country or each region. It's still in some countries, you have full cost recovery policies where farmers you know, have to pay. In other countries, it's still free. So the willingness and the access to vaccines and to maybe very different from one country to the other, and all the, I mean, easiness to access to animal health delivery system in different countries will play a big role. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Um, our next question is posed to Laura and it's from Nargiza Ludgate. And she says, can you elaborate on how you envision to generate fee for vaccination strategy for TPPR in Nepal, while PPR production within Nepal is heavily subsidized and offered to smallholders free of cost? Yeah, maybe Raj, do you wanna unmute yourself and, and talk about that, about uh, what the, the pricing model will be and how you'll um, kind of activate demand for a vaccine when it's already provided for free by the government? Yes, uh, 
Yeah, thank you for providing this opportunity. Actually, uh, this thermostable PPR vaccine, we we are a commercial organization and we plan to sell this uh, vaccine in the market. Uh, having said that, our endeavor is how we can support uh, the government of Nepal's objective of eradicating PPR vaccine. We want to participate in their activities. Wherever we can chip in, we will be supporting the department for the eradication program. Our endeavor is that we will be creating the demand and awareness amongst these uh, smallholder farmers who don't have access to the vaccines and who don't have the knowledge how uh, how much losses they are incurring because of this vaccine. So we will, uh, as Laura mentioned in her presentation, that we will be creating a, uh, this uh, network is already existing. There are certain uh, technicians and paravets already in uh, field working for this uh, eradication program. So we will be providing them required uh, inputs in terms of uh, their capacity building and whosoever will be providing the services in terms of vaccination at ground level, they will be charging whatever margins they, they will have little margins. So it will be close to uh, uh, 70 cents per uh, uh, dose these uh, vaccinators will be charging that will include the cost of the vaccine as well as the services they will be providing. So they will be buying from these uh, nearby retailers and um, uh, from their shop, their margin will be, will be close to 20% so that they can sustain the expenses. So in short, uh, the cost per dose per animal will be uh, 70 cents. Mm. Can I add? Yes, please, Jeffrey. Okay. Uh, I think, too, you need to bear in mind that the, the, the investments from USAID are mainly in terms of uh, the startup cost, the investment cost, not the actual production cost of the vaccine. So Hester will have to stand on its own two feet <laughs> in terms of production costs uh, almost immediately uh, with this vaccine. And uh, the same is true of Mali. Most of these projects, they just get the thing started. It then needs to... Uh, be sold at, at competitive market prices. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Jeff. That's an important aspect of partnering for innovations model is every partnership we go into, we actually cost share with our private sector partners. So every dollar we put into this, this partnership with Hester, Hester is also contributing a dollar. Um, so we're cost sharing this activity 50-50. Um, and, and Jeff's right that really the, the role that we played as a project is to buy down the risk and buy down the cost of transferring this technology in the first place. But after that, Hester operates like any other private sector entity and, and sells this vaccine in a way that makes commercial sense for them and for farmers. Thank you all. Our next question is from Katherine Stahlberg and it's for Jeff. And she says, I was very interested in the participatory risk mapping work. Were there any particular challenges to implementing this? Uh, I, well, your facilitators have to be well-trained and you have to get the, the right group of people together who have, can speak you know, and, and accept each other. We'd been working with the vets and community animal health workers and crowd leaders in that community for, for a while. So they were comfortable to speak and challenge each other and speak frankly, because they come with different perspectives. Um, so I wouldn't say it's difficult, but you know, you need good participatory facilitation skills to, to do a good map. Um, but that's not so hard to get. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Jeff. Our next question is also for Laura, and it's from Surendra Karki, and it says, it's good to see this progress. The planned distribution of 400,000 dosage of vaccines is free for farmers, or is it a cost-sharing basis? Um, in which areas are these vaccines going? Who will select these areas? I believe we've discussed part of, of this question, but perhaps not all. Yeah, so Raj discussed the costing model, so it is not free to farmers. It's also not subsidized, so it kind of stands on its own as a sustainable and viable commercial activity in that sense. Um, so what did you say, Raj, is going to be 70, about 70 U.S. cents for, for farmers at the end of the day? Uh, there is a, a correction. Uh, it is decimal. It is seven cents, not seventy cents. Sorry, this is my even, uh, my even cheaper, here. even better. 
37 cents only. And uh, the second part of the question, uh, the area, actually we, we are not selling this vaccine as of now. We will be targeting the areas where we have a uh, good population of uh, sheep and goats. So this, if, 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 the, if she wants to know about the district, we con uh, conducted one survey in the districts like Jhapa, Morang, Ilam, Sunsari, Saptari, Udaipur, Mahatari, Sarlai, and these are the area 27 districts we have worked and we have our field force in place. So these areas we will be targeting in the initial state. As I mentioned, we are here to support the Department of Livestock for their objective of PPR eradication. If the department wants us to identify other areas, we are ready to work with the in uh, sync with the department. So whatever area department or the Ministry of Agriculture picks and wants us to work, we are happy to work in those areas. But 27 uh, districts we have already identified and we have our field force in place. And I think yes, importantly too, Hester is going to be working with um, the other USAID and donor funded programs on the ground in Nepal to drive demand for this, this vaccine as well. Um, so that's another network they'll kind of leverage to, to get the word out there about the vaccine. Yes, recently we had uh, one MOU signed with the Kisan2, uh, the USAID funded organization. And endeavor is again to uh, educate and create awareness about uh, this, particularly about the disease PPR, because many a times this disease goes unnoticed and farmers, they are not able to understand what is the impact of this disease. So our understanding is that we will be creating the awareness activities. Our focus will be more on creating awareness rather than selling this vaccine. So we, since this de uh, Department of Livestock, they have their vaccine, so we don't want to compete with the department, rather we want to complement and support the department in their endeavor. So we want that Nepal should be free of uh, PPR disease. That is our uh, uh, endeavor and we will be there to support this uh, DLS. Could I add something on, on paying? We're, we're also looking at this in Uganda and um... What it actually does is it empowers the farmer because they then become a paying customer and they have the right to demand a quality service. Yeah. When it's free, the government can tell them, look, you're getting a free thing. You have no right to complain. You should be grateful, blah, blah, blah. But once they're paying, it's, it changes the dynamic and actually gives them more power in the system. So they're, when they fully understand it, they're actually happy to at least partially share in the cost um, if it can bring them better service. We found that interesting in the, the uh, willingness to pay surveys that Hester did well is there was a lot of elasticity in that demand too. Farmers were willing to pay a lot more than we thought they'd be willing to pay for this vaccine, um, which I think speaks to that um, you know, desire to have that, that buying power and also um, kind of an awareness of, of the potential of, of vaccinating their livestock. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. And we have a lot of great questions coming in the chat. So I'm gonna to try to get through as many as I can in the next five minutes. This question is posed to the whole group. So anyone that would like to take it, please chime in. It's from Paula Menzies and she asks, are any projects examining ways of identifying vaccinated animals and looking at generation turnover in flocks? I mean, it's a no for me. Michelle, are you guys doing that? It's again, Mara, I do not I have some break on my, my mic here. Uh, yeah, this is Rajiv Gandhi from Hester, India. We are doing these studies over here, but uh, not yet, not prepared to uh, give this over here because it's under preparation and in days to come, probably we would have uh, a lot of information on this. Hmm. Thank you. Um, this question is for Michelle and it asks, what will be the process for other laboratories to have access to the technology to also produce the thermotolerant vaccines? Um, I, I, I think um, it is the technology, it is available, it is a published yeah. uh, protocol. So um, 
it all depends on what is the capacity maybe to transfer the technology as we did uh, with the support from Hester. So um, I think where we are now is to, uh, to build on the Mali, um, Mali um, example to see really how we can um, go to the end and then go uh, beyond Mali and West Africa. So it would be good to be in touch with them um, with us, uh, with Jeff, with uh, all those people working around this, and then we can discuss any collaboration for with the Mali Lab. Thank you. And I'll add, these technologies are fully published. They're public information. You don't have to pay royalties or ask anybody's permission to use them. <laughs> They're yours for the taking, okay? If you want help, contact Ilri, contact me, and we'll, we'll see how to help you. We can certainly answer questions. If it involves visits and things like that, we have to find funding. We're here to increase the availability of thermal stable vaccine for PPR eradication. Help Felix, the man in the picture. Yeah, uh, if, uh, Raj, <laughs> in, in, case any, in case any government. In case, <laughs> so, so in I, case, I, I, I. Go ahead. So, may I speak? Uh, uh, in case any government lab requires any support in terms of uh, maybe know how we we have since we have developed this vaccine so we are uh, here to support any government lab to uh, give this know how and uh, uh, we are happy that dr jeffrey barina is also there so we can uh, jointly pr uh, provide this support to maybe any government lab including <laughs> Hello? Chandra, yes. may I? Yes, please. Yes, uh, at least I am the one who raised this issue because at, there are several other vaccine producers connected, being Russia, I see colleagues from Russia, from Jordan, from uh, Kenya, from Ethiopia, and so on and so far. We have almost 30 laboratories around the world producing PPR vaccine, but now with the term of tolerant vaccine. The technology will be available. If I understand very well, if the technology is published, any laboratory can maybe use the technology without asking any information to any, any clearance from anybody, if I understand very well. Because in any case, all this laboratory will come to the PPR secretariat being FAO or OIE for any, any further, further advice. Over. Thank you. Perhaps we'll have time just for one more quick question um, before we wrap up. And this will be also for Laura and Hester, and it's from Tyrell Cahan, and he asks, is there any need to booster this vaccine? If so, how will we ensure the booster is received? Since I'm the only one on this panel without a um, PhD, I'm gonna hand that one over to Raj. Raj? Yeah, in uh, this vaccine actually gives protection for lifetime because, uh, but uh, this since this disease is pertaining to uh, smallholder farmers, wherein uh, there are shifting of uh, animals quite regularly, so we have to give uh, how when uh, uh, any number of uh, uh, these sheep and goats uh, they have at any time they should vaccinate. We recommend that they should vaccinate all the animals together. So since there will be shifting of animals, it will be difficult to identify which animal have been vaccinated and uh, which, has, which is left out. So to remove that confusion, we recommend that all the animals should be vaccinated at all time. And uh, there is no harm, there is no side effect if, even if the vaccine is given uh, two times in the lifetime. Otherwise, in terms of coverage, the vaccine has to be given in once, once in lifetime that gives complete protection. But to remove the practical confusions in uh, smallholder farmers, vaccine should be given to all the available animals at a particular time. I hope uh, this answers the question. Yes, thank you so much. And unfortunately, we're reaching the end of our time here today. Um, there were a few questions we weren't able to get to, but we'll try to get answers out if possible. I would like to thank all of our speakers today, Felix, Jeff, Michelle, and Laura for a really rich discussion on PPR control strategies and next steps moving forward in working towards global eradication of PPR.
Thank you so much to all of our participants for joining today. And this webinar was being recorded and it will be available on the Livestock System Innovation Labs website in the near future. Um, so thank you all so much for your participation and have a great day. Bye. Thanks, Mira. Thank you. Mira. Bye -bye. Thank you.